All right, can I get everyone to have a seat so we can get this party started? So, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to Missoula's City Club Missoula uh, February Forum, the issues and challenges with bridge infrastructure in Missoula. Uh, I'm Dave Peppinger. I'm the board chair for City Club Missoula. Thank you all for coming today. This should be a fun conversation. So City Club's <coughs> mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire them on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to civility and civil discourse, even when, challenge, when discussing challenging topics. Uh, before getting into the forum, let me give some sincere thank yous. Uh, thank you to Missoula Community Access Television, uh, which records all of our forums as part of their media access grants to nonprofit organiz organizations. MCAT serves our community with on cable channels 189 and 190. MCAT occasionally live streams our forums on his local live platform as well. You can also find videos of our past City Club Missoula forums by clicking on the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. Um, also, a special thank you to our sponsors, all that you see on the, on the overhead here, as well as the executive level, Blackfoot Communications and First Security Bank. Greatly appreciate that sponsorship. Um, our executive level sponsors are key partners in helping to expand our audience access and reliability planning, reliably planning and conducting our forums. Um, we're grateful to all of our sponsors and we invite any of you uh, to become members as well as sponsors. And of course, uh, the board of directors as well as our administrator, uh, Yenny Rohrbach. Without them, we wouldn't be here doing these forums. So um, today, our speakers for today's panel are Shane Stack from Missoula County Public Works and Joel Boucher, uh, pre-construction engineer from Montana Department of Transportation. And our moderator for today's forum is Rob Cheney. So I'll go through a bios of Rob and then Rob will introduce our speakers. So Rob Cheney is the statewide enter enterprise editor of the Missoulian. Got that one right. Uh, he's been reporting for the Rocky Mountain West since 1987. Cheney served a fellowship at Harvard University ne Neiman Foundation and Journalism in 2020 and has held a statewide reporting projects with Solutions Journalism Network, Stanford University, Big Local News, American Reporting Project, and MIT Tech Review. But aside from writing, he prefers to sleep somewhere in Glacier National Park. <laughs> so with that, Rob, the podium is yours. Thank you, Dave. Can they hear this all right? So uh, first of all, uh, raise your hand if you jumped off the McClay Bridge. <laughs> OK, boomers. So Shane Stack uh, was born and raised in rural Montana and received a bachelor's in civil engineering in 1996. He was employed at the Montana Department of Transportation for 23 years before joining Missoula County Public Works in April of 2019. Shane has lived in Missoula since January 1997 and has been involved with the completion of hundreds of transportation projects across western Montana. Joel Boucher has a bachelor's from MSU, no offense, uh, in engineering and is a licensed engineer in the state of Montana. And he has worked with MDT for nearly 18 years. During that time, he was in construction working in the field for about 15 years before switching to an office role and then took the job as Missoula District pre-construction engineer in January 2023. Um, so for those of you who haven't jumped off the McClay Bridge, um, or driven across it, uh, you, you might want to go out and take a look at it sometime. And it's one of Missoula's oddball little things. It's the bridge that you get across South Avenue, except you do it on North Avenue um, to get 
Missoula's weird history connected. That bridge actually uh, got started. I had, we fortunately did a timeline on this when uh, William Puckett McClay and Fletta McClay filed a property deed in 1891. And in 1893, they built the first bridge across the river at that crossing at what eventually became North Avenue. So we sort of missed on the, on the uh, compass calculations. Uh, we put in the, um, that bridge lasted until 1948 after several, uh, getting, getting damaged several times in floods. And then uh, that uh, flood in 48 took it out in 1952. They put the new bridge in after four residents sued to get it in there. Spring flooding wiped out the southeast approach of that bridge in 1964. Uh, and then it's kind of been steadily declining. In 2003, we closed it as the railroad tie decking uh, needed to be replaced with corrugated metal and concrete. Um, in 2013, we started a year-long planning study to build a new bridge upriver and remove McClay Bridge using federal funding. Um, however, that overlooks that we got uh, this conversation really started for the bridge that we're dealing with right now about 1994. Um, the county moved back and forth about whether to replace it then and we talked about that for several years at the same time that Miller Creek and Linda Vista were getting their big push to become a major subdivision of Missoula. And that kind of shifted the center of gravity a little bit further south to the idea of a bridge at Blue Mountain Road. That conversation went along for a couple of years and eventually kind of ran out of steam. And then it moved back again to replacing McClay Bridge. Um, we had a fair amount of almost activity around 2015-2016 uh, when the county decided to back away from the project. Um, interestingly, at the time, in 2003, we estimated that there were about 22,000 vehicles a day going past what's now the Blue Mountain intersection um, on Highway 93, and they anticipated that by 2025 that was going to grow to 29,000 vehicles a day, and if we put the bridge in there, it would bump up to about 36,000 vehicles if we had uh, Linda Vista traffic coming out through that space. In fact, we just looked this up. The 2022 count for the Blue Mountain intersection on Highway 93 is 33,000 vehicles a day. <laughs> so on the one hand, we're getting pretty close. On the other hand, we're doing that much without a bridge either place there. We closed the bridge to school buses in 2020 because we were seeing too many holes there. At the time, it was recommended to handle about 100 vehicles a day. It was getting about 2,610 a day in 2010. Um, at the time, fire trucks were allowed to go over it once for an emergency at five miles an hour, and they had to come back a different route. <laughs> um, so it's been a, a problem that we've been dealing with for quite a while. It was uh, expected to cost $15 million in 2024 when we were thinking about this back in 2020. Um, I'm interested to see what the folks to my right are estimating the cost is going to be now. Uh, it would have cost in 2022 about $350,000 to remove. $3.6 million to rehab into some sort of a pedestrian only crossing. And I will now leave it to these two gentlemen to tell you what the options are today. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to really talk a lot about bridges in general. So if you came here to talk about just McClay Bridge or South Avenue Bridge, we can certainly do that through Q&A. Um, but this is really meant for to really to cover, a, a, I guess, a broader picture of what the, the situation with the, is, is in you know, Missoula County with bridges and probably nationally with bridges. So just start off 
with maybe, there we go. Uh, start off with uh, just covering what we have and maintain in Missoula County. So we have 450 uh, miles of road, 264 of those are paved, 186 gravel, and then we've also have got 63 miles of non-maintained. And then bridges, 61 bridges over 20 feet long and why that's important. MDT inspects all bridges over 20 feet. The county inspects the bridges that are shorter than that. So the 63 bridges, the county is responsible for inspections. Then we've got total 352 small bridges and culverts. A um, little bit about um, the funding. So a majority of our funding comes from property taxes. So the, the uh, um, when, when you look at your property taxes, you'll see a, a component specific to roads. Most of uh, most folks, and it varies based on your, your value of your property, but I'm gonna say most people are probably paying around $120 for roads, and probably around $15 for bridges when you look at your property taxes. But again, that varies. If you have a, you know, if you're paying $26,000 in property taxes, it's gonna be a lot higher, but most people aren't doing that, so. Um, the revenues on the roadside, 3.3 million, we, we get 330,000 for, um, from the feds, from the Forest Reserve Act, that basically, um, and, and I say 330,000 because it varies. I've, I've seen years where it's 60,000, but because we are surrounded by so much federal land, the feds have realized there's a cost associated with that for the locals, and so that's sort of a, a payment uh, for us to, to try to take care of that. Uh, state gas tax is um, 743, and then the line below that is BARSA, which is the Bridge and Road Safety Accountability Act. We, had a re we received a one-time payment last year of, of $627,000, but essentially BARSA was a different form of gas tax. It was developed probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago. It, it's, go it's gone away now, and all that funding has been diverted essentially into gas tax. So uh, that, that gas tax number of 743 was what we've typically been seeing with a combination of gas tax and BARSA combined. So. And then state entitlement, uh, that funding comes from the state, and the state entitlement essentially, again, kind of like the, the Forest Reserve Act, there's some costs associated with collection of taxes uh, for the state. Um, we receive a, a, a small amount of that money back, so. Uh, total revenues for road, and this was in um, 2024, that's seven million, but that's gonna decrease in 2025 just because of that $600,000 in BARS is gonna go away. Uh, the bridge program, we're around uh, a million in property taxes and then uh, 200,000 in, in state uh, entitlement. So uh, total revenues for bridges, just about 1.2 million. Um, so these are kind of where our, our, our funding goes uh, in general at Public Works when it comes to road and bridges. Personnel costs were right around 4 million. Operations, 2 million. Equipment, 1 million. And that 1 million has, has jumped up just from last year. We were typically spending, gosh, I would say three, 400,000 a year on our equipment. Um, we've got one of our operators in the back. And I would say if you, if you want to ask him and quiz him about the, the equipment we've had in the past, um, we, just, we have old stuff. And uh, it's, it's time to upgrade and, and uh, have safe equipment. Um, capital projects, 900,000. But again, I think, you know, when you, when you see that decrease in, in the 600,000 from Barca, that's probably one of the things that goes down. So uh, total expenditures, say in 2024, you're looking at around 7.9 million. Um, combined road and bridge revenue, though I think for 2025 is gonna be closer to that seven and a half million. So we've gotta figure out where we're gonna make cuts from this year to, to next year. Uh, some basic bridge information. Out of those 61 bridges that I mentioned that MDT inspects, um, we've, got, we've got a handful of them that are kind of these high priority ones. We've got five bridges that are, are load posted. McClay Bridge, we've kind of talked about that, is currently closed. Boy Scout Bridge in Sealy, currently closed as well. Uh, Sunset Hill, it's got a seven ton load limit. Um, and just, I guess, to, to, to maybe paint the picture, like a half ton pickup truck is right around three tons. So um, if you got a, a one ton pickup truck, you're, uh, you, you, might be, you, you might be getting close to that seven ton if you've, you've got anything with you. Uh, Glacier, um, Glacier Creek Road, uh, that's in Condon, that's at a 22 load limit. And I'll show you some pictures of that one, but that, that's got a partial closure on it. And then Styler Drive in Condon, that's got a 31 ton load limit, uh, but it serves seven properties. So it's kind of a lower, lower priority, and it's, it's still at a, at a pretty high load limit. Um, and then we've got four scour critical bridges. Um, 
Boy Scout Bridge on the north end of Sealy, Rock Creek, which is kind of a higher priority project right now, then I'll talk a little bit about that one. Uh, Schwartz Creek in Clinton, and then Cold Creek up in, in Condon. I'll talk a little bit about that project too. Uh, some other bridges, uh, Bench Road up in Grant Creek, uh, that's got a sufficiency rating of a 46 out of 100. Lolo Street, uh, that one's 56 out of 100. Loisel is 49 out of 100, and Arlene Drive in Clinton is 58 out of 100. The Arlene Drive is, is interesting, that's a bridge that goes into Granite County, and I think there's like three homes back there. So. Um, boy, these images might be a little challenging to see, but the picture on the left, you can kind of see the piling that is uh, upstream or on the, the left-hand side. It's sitting at an angle. That was hit uh, by a, a tree uh, coming, coming downstream at an angle and basically knocked that piling out, and that's why we've got half the bridge uh, closed right now. Basically, we've got traffic switched over just to kind of the, the, the other side. Boy Scout Bridge, again, is closed. Uh, the pilings are, a lot of these pilings are just really rotten. Um, back in the 80s, they were able to, I don't know, I suppose maybe half of them, they were able to place the pilings, replace those. They, they cut them, uh, put a new piling in, and they have a sleeve around the base. That keeps the vertical load okay, right? So they're carrying the vertical load. The lateral loads are not stable with that, right? So you can only do that with so many of those pilings. We can't do any more repairs to this structure. So we're, we're really forced to, to replace it. Uh, this one's Lolo Street Bridge. Uh, we've got bold T beams uh, that the bridge basically sits on. You can kind of see the corrosion. You've got exposed steel. Most of those bold T's have exposed steel. And then if you look at the sidewalk, um, there's a ton of rebar sticking out. It, the, the concrete's kind of just uh, deteriorated. So that bridge is uh, in need of replacement as well. So planned improvements, McClay Bridge, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about McClay real quick. Most of you kind of know about this project, but it's been around for a while. Uh, we're in the NEPA process. Um, we're estimating NEPA, and NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act. I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but it's basically the environmental document. We're hoping to have that signed in 2024 with uh, construction in 2026. The estimated cost right now, we're, I think you're in the neighborhood of about 19 million plus or minus. Why that's important, if you look at our budgets, again, if I've got a you know, million dollar budget and bridge program, there's no way that we can manage these large bridges, right? We're, we're, we are underfunded. Uh, right now we're at 30% design. Um, regarding the, the existing condition, we are working on evaluating what repairs need to be made and then we'll evaluate what those costs are and determine whether or not we wanna move forward with repairs. So. Um, there's further investigation too right now where one of our consultants is looking at all the other portions of the bridge. Um, one of the small spans in the, in the existing bridge has some stringers that were uh, corroded quite a bit and that was the reason why we were forced to shut the bridge down. We're looking at all those stringers uh, for the entire length to make sure that uh, we don't, if we're going to make repairs, that we're going to repair everything that needs to be repaired. So. Um, we've got another project. I had mentioned some of the, the challenges with, with probably all of these bridges on, on the, this bottom list. Sunset Hill, if you remember, that was in, in Greeno. We've got a, a preliminary engineering report uh, completed for that. Riverview, Boy Scout, Glacier, and Cold Creek. All those have some sort of issue. They're all in the Sealy Swan and Greeno area, so it's kind of a location-wise, it makes sense to bundle those into one project. So we are uh, planning to submit an application for that in, uh, I don't know, a few weeks. That one's uh, estimated to be about $28.5 million. We do have uh, Senate Bill 536 funding. that we, we received a million dollars out of Senate Bill 536. There were $10 million available for the entire state. It was uh, kind of a competitive process. Missoula County was uh, quick to react and we're able to get a million dollars for that project, which is the most we could get out of that program. So I uh, feel, feel lucky there. Um, same project, or I guess same bridges, different project. Uh, there's another uh, grant program out there, BIP. Uh, I think I mentioned the last one was raised. This one is BIP, uh, Bridge Investment Program. Uh, it's a little bit different funding and there's a match required and so we still have that million dollars out of Senate Bill 536 to use towards that. 
but I don't have enough money to match all the, all the bridges that would be replaced with raised, so we narrowed it down to the three. It's still a $20 million project, and it's the, probably the highest priority uh, bridges out of that, that list of five. Lolo Street, we did submit a protect grant uh, for 3.8 million. That was submitted in August. We should know soon whether or not we are successful with that. Uh, and, and if we are, that'll be a complete bridge replacement on Lolo Street. Uh, Bench Road uh, in Grant Creek, we, uh, we've submitted uh, MSEP, which is the Montana Coal Endowment uh, Program uh, for planning grants. So that'll get us some funding to do a little bit of engineering. And then after that, once we have some engineering done, we can uh, apply for uh, construction work. All right, um, some additional plan improvements. Sh uh, Schwartz Creek, we're, we're already working on a preliminary engineering report for rehabilitation and scour mitigation on that. Petty Creek, uh, rehabilitation, uh, PER, and then Van Buren and Mountain View. Uh, those are pedestrian bridges. We're just looking at railing replacements on those. Uh, in fact, we've, we've just, uh, we've got a draft um, PER for the, for the Mountain View. Rock Creek, uh, this is, I'll just kind of touch on this really quick. The image on the, the far left is a two-year event and the, in that area shaded in red is kind of area of concern when it hits those piers. Uh, it's not bad, we think you know, it'll, uh, Rock Creek would survive that two-year event. When you get to the five-year, uh, it starts to get a little bit more critical. Uh, the good news is you know, we haven't had uh, events like that two-year, five-year event for a while, so, and, and um, we, we think we will be okay, but uh, you know the strategy right now is to do some armoring this spring uh, on that uh, on those piers just to make sure that they're going to be stable throughout the high water. All right, challenges. Um, funding is the big one. Uh, we passed a local option gas tax here in, in 2020 uh, that was on the ballot. The voters in Missoula County uh, voted to have a gas tax. It was two cents. It was going to generate about $1.2 million a year. I would estimate that we'd probably be close to $1.4 million right now. That was split 50-50 with the city. The legislature in 21 eliminated the ability for um, local governments to have local option gas taxes right after that. So thank you. Um, some, uh, some, of a the, some of the funding we have has limited uses. So you know there are a lot of folks, I get a lot of comments of, well, you're spending money over here. Why don't you spend it on your bridges? And we can't because the money that is dedicated to those types of programs are dedicated to those types of programs and not bridges. Just like I can't use the bridge funding to go um, you know, buy park equipment. So, uh, and then we, uh, we do have limited funding for in in infrastructure. Uh, there's, I think there's public burnout on taxes. People are not interested in paying more in taxes, which I totally get. And then what I would say too for, for us as a result of those limited dollars, our staffing has gone down. We, in, in the early 20s, we had 23 operators here in the Missoula area. We're down to 18. Uh, at that time, we had four folks dedicated in the summertime to go out and just address issues with bridges. Uh, and we don't have that now. NIMBYism, uh, not in my backyard. Uh, that's a big challenge for us because if we're trying to replace um, a structure, um, and we have folks opposed because they don't want extra traffic in their neighborhood. It, it's really hard to deliver. And then permitting, uh, go back to like the Rock Creek Bridge, for instance. We're trying to get Pier Scour taken care of. It's going to take months to, to get uh, permitting that we need just to get some rocks in the river. Uh, recent success stories. Um, Bible Lane, we replaced that in Alberton. Uh, that was a $500,000 uh, in 2020. Main Street, same thing. That's in Frenchtown. And then Moxon Lane was closed a few years ago. Uh, I think it was 2021 when that closed. Uh, our, we used our crews and uh, were able to just replace that with a, a culvert. So that is all I have. The, uh, the last message I want us to send is that we need letters of support for our RAISE grant and our BIP grant. And all those uh, will be uh, bridges replaced up in the Sealy Swan area and, and Greeno. So if you are interested, give me a call, give me an email. I'd love to have letters of support. So thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stand over here because I got some notes here that I, I don't have it quite as well memorized. Can you guys hear me okay back there? Is this on? Okay, perfect. 
Uh, all right, I'm Joel Bouget, and I'm going to focus more on MDT's approach to bridges and, and kind of what that looks like at a statewide level. Um, obviously, this is not just a Missoula County issue. This is not just a Missoula issue. This is really not even just a statewide issue, but this is something that really affects the whole country. So this is something that we're addressing across the board uh, completely. Uh, just in the state of Montana alone, There we go. Just in the state of Montana alone, there's over 5,000 bridges, and nearly half of these bridges are approaching their design life. Uh, the needs that we have right now are far outpacing the amount of money that the state and the counties have. So keeping up with the routine maintenance, the replacement cycles, really just the maintenance on these bridges, just we just haven't been able to do it. We haven't been able to keep up with that. Uh, there's 520 load posted bridges across the state. Um, with the current projection by 2028, we're looking at about 800 of these bridges across the state load posted. Uh, it's not just a matter of addressing the load posted bridges, but really we need to find a way to address, you know, how do we deal with these aging bridges in this aging infrastructure, like I said, across the state, across the country. Uh, this is kind of the projection we're looking at here. Um, I don't know if there's a laser pointer on this or not, but the top line, the orange line, that's going to be your off system bridges. So these are the bridges that are county bridges that are not basically state-owned bridges. So that's most of the bridges Shane's talking about and all other 56 counties across the state. The blue line below that, that is going to be uh, bridges on state MDT state routes. So as you can see, it's, it's not looking good. <laughs> uh, they're showing that we can see that 800 in 2033 there on the end of that chart. So the governor reached out to us and said, hey, we need to come up with a five-year plan to see how we can address this, to see what we can do with this. Um, really, the strategies that MDT came up with, what we started to realize, we said, hey, you know, these are some of the challenges is, that we're having. Uh, we don't have the staffing capacity. We don't, we don't have just the means and the resources internally to really deliver these projects in a timely manner. Um, this is a nationwide issue. Um, we're looking at, you know, motivating and incentivizing contractors. How do we get the contractors on board that want to do this work? You know, bring them into the state to actually do the work here, right, to grow that as well. Um, there's a lot of grants available, but all this is very highly competitive. You know, some of the stuff they're looking at for these grants is the time of delivery, you know, the, all the, the permitting process, the NEPA and everything like that that Shane mentioned before. It, just a lot of factors that go into this. So we're looking at, okay, how do we streamline this from the state's perspective. So really what we're focusing on is first, how do we increase our resources? You know, we're looking at, you know, competitive wages, getting it so we can actually attract more engineers and, and more folks to come to us to help us deliver these projects, to, to increase the staffing so we can actually get these projects out the door. We're looking at how do we make these competitive? How do we make it so we want contractors to come bid on these? You know, maybe bundling projects, combining projects, um, doing whatever it takes to, to, to make contractors want to get here and not just come work on a bridge, but actually stay here and, and make this a long-term solution. So that's where the funding comes in. How do we make this a, sustain, a sustainable funding that it's not just a one hit, right? It's not, hey, we got this much money to do a bridge this year, but it's an ongoing thing where, where contractors can actually, you know, build some kind of a routine, build some kind of future working on our bridges and helping us fix this issue. Uh, the second thing we're looking at is how do we make this more efficient? You know, how can we come up with creative means to get these projects out the door faster? You know, maybe we're looking at, you know, design, build, um, alternative contracting, you know, different ways of delivering projects. Uh, maybe looking at, you know, prefab bridges, you know, something like that where, where we can actually do the construction faster, get them in, get them out, and, and just move this along. You know, saves cost. You can cut the time down it takes to do a project. It saves cost. Uh, traffic control, all those issues, you know, spike costs over time. Uh, the third thing we're looking at, how do we come coordinate with all of our sister agencies and, and really get this permitting process, get the delivery process shortened. You know, right now it's, there's, there's so much that we have to go through between the permitting and, and just all the paperwork and, and all, the, all the requirements that we have. How do we streamline that process and get these bridges from, hey, this bridge needs to be addressed, how do we get it out the door and actually fixed? So these are the areas we're really focusing on working on and really, really moving the ball forward with this. Uh, one of the great things that we have going for us too with, like I said, funding is, is a major issue here because obviously we, we, I mean, you heard Shane's budget and we have millions and millions of dollars worth of, of needs across the state. So how do we, how do we address this? You know, one of the things that, that our senators came up with is Senate Bill 536. Um, in this bill, they provided $100 million to the, the Department of Transportation 
Um, this money is for local governments for the maintenance of county roads, uh, city roads, and town roads. Um, per the language of the bill, 20 million of this right off the top has to go to incorporated cities and towns with a population of less than 10,000. So what's left of that bill, that's really the funding that we can use for this off-system bridge repairs, uh, secondary highway system routes, urban system routes. Um, the other thing that's very important about this bill is it allows us a, a pot, we put about 10% aside, that's going to allow us to do these matches on these federal grants. So with all these federal grants, there's typically about a, depending on the grant, anywhere from 15 to about 25% match that, that the local community has to come up with match that. So MDT is saying, hey, we're going to set $10 million aside of this money for that money, right, to, to help these counties with that match, because we know that the local communities can't do that. Something to keep in mind, too, that um, was brought to my attention is that if you are a local community looking at doing a grant, putting in for a raise grant that needs one of these matches, Make sure you let us know, because if we don't know you're putting it for the grant, we don't know how to match it, right? So let us know if there's a need, and we'll see what we can do to figure that out. The, the real focus of what we want to do with this money, what MDT wants to do with this money, is focus on load-posted off-system bridges. So that is something that we're, we're definitely focused on, because we do see the need. We do understand, hey, these communities are getting blocked off. Hey, this, there's issues that are coming out of these closures. Let's do something to get these going. Um, yeah, part of this, like I said, part of this is set aside for those local matches, uh, excuse me, the grant matches, and part of this is also set aside for immediate repairs. You know, we have a portion of this money set aside to go to work right now to get back, hey, let's get these bridges fixed up, let's get these bridges opened, let's make some money available so we can actually do this. Uh, we were able to work with the association of the counties, and this is kind of how they decided to break up that money that we got, that $100 million, so about $10 million of it down at the bottom, like I said, that's for the grant match. $20 million of it, that's for the quick fixes. That's for, hey, this bridge needs our help right now. What can we do to get this going? What can we do to get the load posting raised? You know, what can we do to get it open? You know, whatever that, that pencils out between the county and the state. Um, direct allocations, $20 million to local government. Uh, that's set right in the language of the bill right off the top. And then $50 million left over for the state to work with counties and, and directly administer uh, projects across the state. So with our current funding and what's currently going, uh, we need about $125 million a year just to address the off-system bridges for the next decade or more. So we need an increase of about $125 million a year just to fix those bridges. If you encounter our on-system bridges as well, that number gets up and approaches closer to $400 million a year. So as you can see, this is, this is a major statewide issue, major, major national issue, right? No one can tackle this alone. Um, we need to work together. We need to work with FHWA. Uh, we need to be working with the counties. We need to be working with local communities, other state agencies, and really everybody be putting their heads together to, to, get, this, to, to, to get this resolved, to get a solution in mind for this. Um, we're going to work together to pursue grant funding, um, to find ways, like I said, to lower those, those costs of replacing bridges, um, delivery methods of economy of scale. So we're talking about, you know, Bundling bridges, making it more, more enticing for contractors, finding more efficient ways to get these projects done. Another thing we're looking at is, you know, evaluating routes. Maybe there's some routes where these bridges just don't make sense. You know, maybe you have bridges that are sucking up funds, funding, sucking up resources that, hey, this doesn't make sense. This is not a strategic plan for this bridge and, and closing these bridges. You know, maybe it's taking and actually replacing bridges with culverts and, and actually finding other solutions where we can take bridges off of our system and, and use a different solution or use a different fix. So we can basically get that number of bridges and get that demand down so we can address it more effectively. So this is kind of where we are right now. Um, SB 1536 is currently in action and we see those funds going out. Uh, we've actually had over $11 million go out for 19 different projects. Um, through those, it was about 15 off-system bridges, one on-system bridge. Uh, we have, they applied for a grant, a PROTECT grant, which is a Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformation Efficient and Cost Savings Transformation. Gotta love the names they come up with. Uh, that's a $23.3 million grant that replaces 14 bridges. Uh, still waiting to hear back on that one. Uh, another one they put, they're putting in for in March, that we're putting in for in March here at MDT is a raise grant for $28.5 million to replace the Sportsman Bridge up in Big Fork, Montana. 
Uh, that's a, a narrow two-lane bridge that's, once again, reaching its design life that needs to be replaced up there. Uh, they're also looking at putting in for a $65 million for 65 off-system bridges as well, and that's, those are both the bridge investment program grants, just like Shane had mentioned before. Some other grants that we've looked at and applied for, uh, we applied for $25 million for a raise grant for the Montana 37 bridge project, $25 million in raise grants for the, the timber bridge bundle project, $11 million in BIP, another $5 million in another BIP uh, for a Yellowstone sour critical. So, so there's multiple opportunities for these grants and, and we are very heavily focused on this because we understand that's where a lot of this funding is going to have to come from. We're going to have to look for help outside of ourselves to get these done. Uh, none of those we've either haven't got or haven't heard back yet. Uh, we were also awarded about $66.4 million for the multimodal project dis discretionary grant, the MPDG grant for the I-90 project, which replaces three bridges on the I-90 uh, near Alberton. So that's pretty exciting we're getting that done too. And, and the great thing about these grants too is it allows us to free up funding from other sources so we can actually focus that money on bridges and get those bridges repaired. Uh, and the lastly, the other thing we're doing is we are reaching out to those sister agencies. We are working with these other agencies to help streamline the system so we can get these delivered faster. So that's pretty much all I have. That's kind of the state of where we're at right now from the statewide perspective. So there's my information if you need it. You can reach out to me and, and you know, I should be able to get you any additional information and links to our website that has bridge information and, and all that fun stuff as well too. So thank you. All right, perfect. Now we've moved on to the best part, right? We all get to sit around and come up with a really good question from one table. Okay, from all the tables, but just one person per table. So we'll get there, but let me go through the rules real quick. So table talk is a very rich part of every city club forum and arguably the gist of why we're here. Uh, we'll take about 10 minutes here. So the rules are simple. At your table, have a general discussion about Introduce yourselves, and then what I ask is that you appoint one ambassador for your table, and then when we go around, we'll have two people with microphones. When we go around, whoever that ambassador is, please raise your hand so we know who you are, and then we will address you. We will go back and forth on the room here, so we try and get as many tables as we can. So, um, And I will be back at 12.30 to get it started up. So I'll see you soon. So as I stated before, um, at the beginning, we're committed to civil discourse. And so we ask to keep the questions respectful and that you avoid making statements. We understand that there's some dialogue that has to occur before the question, but keep it at a minimum. Because as you can see, we've got a lot of people in the room here and a lot of tables to get through. So please keep your precursor speech to a minimum. Um, uh, what else? So, also we ask the members of the media, please hold off on your questions until after the forum. Um, when asking your question, please be sure to stand up, clearly state your name, avoid statements, and ask one question. Um, we have, we'll have two people with microphones uh, that will come by your table to ask a question. Please raise your hand, let them know who you are, um, so we can get this rolling. So I will be back towards the end to close up. But we'll be here for about 30 minutes. Okay, stand. Stand up. <laughs> I, I'm Dan Lee Logie, and, and the question from our table is, uh, what Joel was talking about the alternative contracting and the design build, and, and if we get an idea how much money that saves and whether the county has looked into that to try and save and stretch their dollars just a little bit more with those similar ideas. I think I'm on here. Um, as far as a dollar amount, I don't, I can't answer to that. I don't have an exact number for what that would save. Really what you're looking at is that it, the way that that helps and the way that that saves is it allows, I don't know if creative means is the right answer, but it allows different problem solving when, you, when a contractor is working with a designer, they can come up with different solutions to problems, which can lead to cost savings. Uh, the other thing it does is it saves time. So, you know, time is money. If you can get projects out the door faster, typically that's going to save in permitting, that's going to save in inflation, that's going to save in a lot of other variables that does increase a potential project cost. 
Yeah, Denley. Um, yes, we are. Um, the, uh, the build grant, for instance, we use CMGC, construction manager, general, general contractor, and you hire a consultant, then you also hire a, 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 a contractor engineer separately. Um, that contractor is giving you pricing as you're developing that project. They're pr part of the team trying to do the design work. And really, um, what you're what that does is it, it reduces risk and pricing, so you can kind of scope appropriately um, and keep your keep your pricing um, within within reason. The other thing too is just constructability. You've got your contractor on board uh, helping you out with that design, so we're we're not you know the normal process is design bid build. Um, so you design it, um, bid it out, and then they build it. Well, the contractor is getting it at the very end, and and you know if there's anything wrong, um, you know. You, you're having to deal with that during construction and prices can escalate. So yes, um, you know, whether it's uh, design build uh, or CMGC, any of the, the, the methods, we're definitely using them. Hi, my name is Karen. And um, my table did not have a specific question for you because we were so busy talking with two representatives of, uh, of Missoula's um, work with Bridges and also among ourselves trying to figure out um, what is it that, that's happening here? And so I've just made up a question. <laughs> My question relates to what I heard you say earlier about Missoula County voting to pay for more bridges in the past to pay more for the infrastructure of Missoula. And that, that being canceled by the legislature, and it hasn't happened again, so far as I know. So, the, so taxes on gas, was that correct? Tax, small tax, yeah, two cents a gallon? Something two like cents, that? yep, two cents. Yeah. So if Missoula was like that just a few years ago, my question, I guess, is for everybody, for all of us, how can we motivate and help to um, encourage people who live near the McClay Bridge <laughs> or other really difficult places to understand how invaluable it is what you're doing. What's, what's your, let's say PR, if you'd like, <laughs> uh, but also just outreach. That's a long thing, sorry about that. Wow, there's there's a lot of questions in there, and the first one, <laughs> maybe the first one is what is going on, I, and maybe we can. Uh, I think that's a great question, and I, I think over time, it, especially at the local level, um, I would just say, um, the legislature has limited the ability for local governments to tax, and and so that's created a bit of a strain, and so we're able to increase our taxes by half the rate of inflation, and that's since probably the 90s. If you continue to do that, you're going to slowly choke the ability of, of these communities to fund themselves. And, and so when you start, you know, what has happened? Well, we've underfunded local government. We've underfunded the uh, amount of funding that is going towards our infrastructure, for one. But at a national level, we haven't increased the gas tax at the federal level. It's 18 cents since 93, 94. So we continue to tax at a, at a rate um, you know, from the 90s. Uh, and, and I know nobody, again, nobody wants to pay more taxes. Um, but I'll tell you at, at the federal level too, what's going on is, is uh, when you look at the highway trust fund, and I, I can't tell you when the last time it was actually solvent and paying for itself. Right now, it's probably, I, I would say it's subsidized through um, your income taxes essentially, general fund. Uh, probably to the tune of probably 20 to 25 percent, and and that's you know kind of a, a, a rough guess on my part. But just understand, you know, most people think I, I go to the pump, I'm paying for the roads, but you're not. Um, you're paying for about 75 percent of them. So there's the challenge. And then I think your other question: How do we get? I think it was how do we get folks that that, that might live around, say, McClay Bridge, to to maybe support? Was, was that the question? Or yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer. If I knew the answer, I would do it. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I would tell you, my, you know, my challenge is, is that it doesn't matter if we build a bridge uh, that connects to north or if it connects to south. 
there are going to be people that are disappointed, right? And so what I have to do is look at this and say, what's in the best interests of Missoula County? And make a decision that's, that's based on solely really on that. And then, unfortunately, there are going to be some folks that are unhappy and some folks that uh, are going to be ecstatic, right, that, that there's a change. So, um, and, and ultimately, it's not, I shouldn't say I make a decision, but I'm, I'm certainly pushing a direction that, you know, the process that really dictates um, where the, where the bridge is built, right? And, and, and so we're, we're leaning heavily on the NEPA process uh, to, to really guide where uh, a bridge is built. So hope, I, I hope I got all your questions there. Okay, Stan. Um, okay, I did not want to be the spokesperson, but I'm gonna be it. Um, so we had a very vibrant discussion in our group, and one of the things um, that we discussed, we believe the biggest issue is how these bridges create potential choke points um, if they fail, especially in the event of emergency evacuations. What I'm thinking about is wildfires. We haven't even discussed the bridge overpasses for um, uh, the rail. Uh, that wasn't brought up in the discussion at all in terms of hazmat and real emergency situations. And so off of that, one, where is the emergency funds if this occurs? I don't hear any discussion here, or we don't, about where those emergency funds are. And a special things like special improvement district or bonding, number one. And number two, should we be discussing how these choke points influence development decisions that prevent more stress on these bridges, linking it to how we're discussing development of the city? Thank you. Well, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, so emergency funding, and I don't know if you're talking like FEMA. Um, emergency fund, we're talking about funding for specific Just having, emergency. having. We don't have a general position emergency fund okay. in the event and how we prioritize that on the Sure, so yeah, I, what we try to do is keep a, you know, a reasonably sized cash balance, but you know, that's, that's, always, that's always hard. And, and what I would tell you, like a bridge, for instance, like uh, Boy Scout, that's, that's greater. That is, you know, the cost of that is, um, you know, right now, current cost is 11 million roughly, right? So when we're talking probably two years down the road before we can build it. Um, so that's probably gonna escalate to over 12 million by then. I don't have $12 million saved um, for a, you know, for a, a fix it. So I can handle some smaller bridges, but I don't have that kind of cash. Uh, and then FEMA, you know, what I would tell you, you know, there's potentially some relief there if it's a disaster. So you'd have to have a state and federal disaster declared and then some pretty serious damage of a structure. Then you could probably be looking at, um, you know, some federal dollars to help you uh, replace a structure. But yeah, I, I, I'd love to tell you that there are enough revenues in our taxes that we can save up a bunch of money to have a rainy day fund, but frankly, we're just getting by. So, and then um, that kind of talks about the funding piece. I guess what was your next question really related to like just a, like emergency and, and fire? So there's, there's two aspects to this. Part of it is alternative, if there is an emergency, I don't think this city is prepared. Let's just put it bluntly. If we're in the middle of, of a major hazmat event, or we're in the middle of a bridge collapsing um, because of wildfire, getting people out of choke points, I don't think we're prepared. I don't think we're adequately prepared for that. And the bridge discussion doesn't entail that, number one. And number two, in terms of funding, how we're talking about funding this, it should be linked to how we're talking about alternative development plans. If we're already having stress on bridges, and we're already at 29,000 people crossing a bridge, why are we having more development in that area until we solve the choke point issue? Sure. Yeah, I think there's, I think, I guess a couple points is, the, the planning component of uh, recognizing that we have limited capacity with our structures and that why are we allowing development, right? And, and I think, yeah, that, I think that's a, a good point. Um, but we also need housing, so I, I don't know how we balance the need for housing and, and the infrastructure. I think we probably need to start focusing a little bit more money on our infrastructure too to make sure we, we have that adequate capacity. And then, yeah, the, uh, the emergency um, for, you know, just 
locally here in Missoula, I guess I've never thought about it that much. Um, un unfortunately, I can, I can look at like some of the communities that we serve in the rural, or the more rural areas. Um, and that, you know, I certainly have concerns there because there are locations where there's just one way in and one way out and they're crossing a wooden structure, right? And, and so if there's a fire that comes through and it gets to that bridge, yeah, there's probably in trouble. Uh, but again, I don't have the funding to go replace all of those structures right now. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Tolley. Have a slightly different question um, regarding the McClay Bridge specifically. What would it take to get it up and running in any capacity that would allow foot traffic on it? And that is because of the Missoula Marathon coming up. We have heard that there's, uh, they'll have to reroute it and people may not be able to get out in time to recertify the marathon so that people could come and qualify for like the New York, Boston marathons, et cetera. And that could then have an economic impact on Missoula. So is there a chance of getting it up and running in any way? Yeah, so uh, again, I kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, we'll evaluate the structure, what repairs need to be made, and then determine whether or not um, we, can, we can make those uh, repairs. Understand that, you know, I wouldn't be that worried about the Missoula Marathon because they are so spaced out. But when, you, when you're talking about the half, if you've ever watched the half, and, it, and, and especially close to the beginning, it's not like they're spread out right and that humans have a mass um all right so that's a lot of people across that bridge it would what i would tell you is you know we've evaluated it and looked at it just from the you know the the, the half marathon perspective before when it was just the 11 ton load limit and said all right how much room do we have are we still comfortable with you know a bunch of people running across this thing and at that time um I, you know i felt comfortable with that um i will see what uh, what comes out of these evaluations and what repairs need to be made. And if there, it's entirely possible that the, there's going to be a lower load limit on it too, rather than the 11 tons, maybe it goes down to three tons or seven tons. I don't know what, what that's going to look like, but um, yeah, I, I, I get that uh, it's, it's, you know, not the best thing for the Missoula Marathon. Um, Boy Scout Bridge closed. The snow joke uh, has to be rerouted too. Um, we're, we're not looking to do looking to do that. I you know fully support the marathon and, and the half marathon up in Sealy. I've raced both of them. Enjoy it. Uh, I, I love to see those races. But unfortunately, when you're talking life, health, and safety type things, it's like that's a priority rather than whether or not somebody qualifies for the New York or Boston Marathon. So. I, I just want to add something too to that. That's great, by the way. Um, I don't think people realize, but if you have a six ton, or excuse me, a three ton weight limit on a bridge, you figure an average person about 150 pounds, that's only 40 people. And I, I think people don't realize how small a number that is, and you're at the weight limit. We just assume, hey, yeah, that's a big truck going across. No, that's 40 people standing on a bridge is at capacity if it's a three ton weight limit. So just something to keep in mind when with pedestrians. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Bob Campbell. Our conversation uh, more or less centered on like why bridges degrade erosion, weatherization, and whatnot. Kind of we use an analogy of like a cancer on a bridge. Early detection's a key. So we're kind of wondering what kind of program or funds or manpower is in place, both at the county and the state level, to go out and inspect these bridges, even the newer bridges, so we could look and see if we could detect problems early, get ahead of it remediate those issues before they become a big deal, before we're finding ourselves in situations where you gotta spend major amounts of money on stuff. Yeah, maybe I'll go first. So we do have a, a bridge inspection position, and, you know, so the 61 bridges that are inspected by MDT, MDT will inspect the county bridges and they'll give us a, a list of, of repair items that, that they think we should we should be doing or just even regular maintenance, right? So they'll tell us like, what, what should we be doing on those 61 structures? 
the other 63 that we're doing inspections on, um, you know, we do that ourselves. So we'll go out and inspect and figure out what work needs to be done as far as maintenance. And you know, we, we do as much of that as we can. I don't know if you remember in the slide though, when I mentioned that in the two, early 2000s, we had what, 23 staff members and now we're down to 18 staff members. When I, when I talk staff members, it's you know, operators that are physically going out and doing that work. So we're down five and that's not for any other reason than we just don't have the funding to, to keep 23 people on board. At that time, we had four folks dedicated to um, going out and just preparing bridges all summer, right? That's, that was their main goal, and we don't have that right now. So those 18 folks have to divide their time up between road repair and bridge repair. And I get a lot more calls about potholes than I do about bridges. People don't. People honestly don't get under the bridges and look and say, you should fix this. They, they drew by, they, you know, they definitely see potholes, and that that's a higher priority for them. And, and you know, so we end up having to, you know, make tough decisions on where people go and what, you know, what work gets done. Yeah, as, and as far as MDT staff goes, we do, uh, uh, the bridges are on about a two year cycle. So we typically go out to a bridge and inspect it. Um, if there's reason for that to be more frequent, then that happens as well. Uh, one of the points I mentioned before is it's about, what, $127 million a year on top of our current program to keep up with the maintenance that we have on those bridges. So that's for us, that's really where the gap lies is right there. It's, it's that additional funding to actually keep up with the, with the repairs and, and keep those bridges where they need to be. Um, you don't necessarily see everything that's going on with an inspection. Sometimes they need to dive a little bit deeper and that's when we'll go out to a consultant or, or you typically use a consultant to do like load ratings and stuff like that as well. Kelly Durbin Williams, um, <clears throat> I was grateful for a person at our table to remind us that in 2021, um, the bipartisan infrastructure deal was passed at the federal level. And we're just curious, I, I quickly Googled the whitehouse.gov and it, it stated that uh, this was the largest investment in repairing um, and reconstruction of our nation's bridges since the construction of the interstate highway system. How much of that did Montana get? And furthermore, maybe Missoula. I don't have a dollar amount offhand. Um, I could look that up and find that. But uh, those, a lot of those grants that we talked about, that BIP grant, that RAISE grant, that PROTECT grant, that's alphabet soup of grants, that is, most of that's coming from that bill. So what that exact number is, I, I don't know offhand. Oh, absolutely. We're, yeah. we're getting as much as we can and then, and then some with the state government doing the same thing I'm, as well. I'm just going to throw out a total guess, but I would say like, MDT is probably going to get 500 million, but that's you know the, the that particular bill. I think the the difference between that bill and previous bills was that there's so much more discretionary funding that the locals can get to, right? But it's all um, grants, and you've got to be competitive. And so what we've done at Missoula County is we've we've developed these pre preliminary engineering reports, and you know we've started these two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're just starting today. Right now we're submitting these grants in the next couple months from labor that was done or started two years ago. So we're, we're trying to take advantage of it, but it does take time to, to, to get that funding. We talked a little bit also about the matches needed for these grants. How much of the IRA and the other new money is also requiring matches that you have to find? So, <clears throat> great question. Um, the raise, we're, we're fortunate to be in a, in a rural state. Um, there's no match requirement for raise, but there is a $25 million match, um, or sorry, maximum. So, you know, with, uh, with the million dollars that we've received through Senate Bill 536 and then applying for, for the, the raise at 25, we'd, we'd have 26 million to do five bridges, but again, I'm, I'm still having to come up with probably two and a half million dollars just to cover that additional cost. So it's not, it's not cheap. And, Infrastructure cost is, is very high, and it's, it's surprisingly high. Yeah. I, I know across the district, um, Kalispell was awarded the grant to build reserve. I believe that was a $25 million. Um, CSKT was awarded 33 for that first section of the nine pipe corridor, and then another eight and a half for their wildlife pilot overcrossing. Um, one of the benefits of the CSKT grants is there's not a match on those, so that's, that helps us a little bit. <laughs> Uh, they're also applying currently for two more grants in that corridor for the tune of, I, I don't know the number, 60, 60 plus million, I believe they're still trying to get in that area. Uh, we did get the 66.4 for the, multi, the uh, I-90 projects. 
Um, Missoula's got a couple for a Safer Streets for All grant that they're doing, the SAM project, the downtown SAM. Mm -hmm. um, they currently have applications for the 200 corridor. Um, you can check out the Missoula website and, and you can read more about those. Um, Hamilton received a planning grant for their Main Street, Marcus Avenue down there. Um, CSKT also, another Safe Streets for All grant for um, their planning across the district. Uh, Kalispell was awarded a city a SS4 grant, Safer Streets, Safer Streets for All grant as well for their downtown. So there's, there's grants all over, and that's just the, this district. So across the state, it's, it, they're all over the place. So it's, it's hard to keep track. <laughs> there's a lot of them. Yeah, can, but yeah. Can I, I just want to add to that, sorry. And, and it, just as a reminder, we, you know, the county did receive uh, the $13 million in bill grant. And again, you know, we partnered with uh, the city of Missoula and the MPO for the South Avenue Safe Streets and Roads. So we are, we have been successful. Um, it's not that we don't have the money coming in. Yeah, Missoula County, uh, Missoula, the MPO, City of Kalispell, they've been very successful at it. So they've been doing a great job writing those grants. And, and I know there's some designers in town and RPA has written some of the grants. Uh, there's just been a lot of people out there doing just a, a magnificent job writing these grants. Uh, MDT, we did actually start, and, and we've started a whole new team in Helena that is really just focused on the grant program. And we're starting to write some internal grants as well too. So we're, we're definitely taking full advantage and, and trying to get as much as we can so we can get, we can get these projects out the door, you know, right time, right now. My name is Ted Stetler. Our table discussion centered around the fact that the bridge is planned and costs to pay for it, et cetera. But what about all the infrastructure leading up to, like Big Flat, Blue Mountain Road, O'Brien Creek, places like that, uh, even South Avenue itself? Uh, the improved traffic uh, is going to be. Uh, Can you speak into the mic? Okay, sorry. I, I don't. I don't do this often. So, so it, it's. Is there been a study? What's the cost going to be above and beyond, say, a replacement bridge itself, uh, for all these other things that are going to be needed up to that? Yeah, great question. Um, so, for South Avenue, and just as we were talking about the grants piece, right? So, uh, City of Missoula, Missoula County did receive um, funding for South Avenue from Reserve to Clements. And then right now, uh, the county is, is at probably at 30% design, plus or minus for improvements on South Avenue uh, to the bridge, across the bridge to uh, Blue Mountain Big Flat. Um, I don't have a cost estimate on that, but we're, we're darn close to, to having that. Uh, and then once we have that, then it's a matter of, all right, where does that match come from? Uh, and what, what program? Is it raise? Is it safe streets uh, for all? Uh, is it a combination? Um, and do we partner with MDT uh, with, the, with, with the bridge project? So there's the South Avenue piece. Um, the work plan this year does have, um, you know, paving and things like that for South, or sorry, not South, but uh, Blue Mountain Road and Big Flat. Um, really, it's going to depend um, on how much money that, you know, we have in the budget to do the work. Uh, we'll do the work ourselves uh, we've got a paving crew um, it's just really a matter of the cost of asphalt i don't have a bid on asphalt yet this year but i would say we're probably in the neighborhood of 120,000 a mile um, plus or minus so um, we're we'll, we'll probably um, focus on some areas first and then you know if, if it's if it's something that we need to continue on into the next summer we'll we can do that too All right, with that said, we really can't handle one more question because we're right at the end. So uh, as most of you know, the last conversation that I had in this room with everyone was that we were going to have to vacate the Doubletree. Um, plans have changed a little bit. So we will be here in the Doubletree for the majority of this year. So exactly. Um, so as of this conversation, that's what I know. We'll certainly share what we know when we know. Um, I believe it goes through October. We may have to find another location, but we'll certainly keep you up to, up to date on that. Um, again, thank you to all of our sponsors, especially First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, as well as some of the new ones that came on board, which I don't have that current list, so 
my apologies for that. Um, Double tree renovations. Um, also, if you're interested, March, we will have the uh, Montana Association of Counties presented here. So uh, please be sure to follow up with that. Hopefully everyone got a lot of information. I know I sure did. So thank you to our presenters and enjoy the rest of your day.